So, in the first video, what we're going to do is we're going to cover the historical, sociological, uh, emotional, economic stuff. The historical, some political, some religious context out of which the religious society of Friend emerged. So we're going to trace it um, from Jesus to uh, Margaret Fell and her husband, Judge Fell, and George Fox, kind of giving the arc of uh, Christian history uh, in a very short amount of time, and we'll leave kind of with the beginnings of the religious society starting to form and follow it up in the next video with some more information about the silent, unprogrammed meeting for worship. Obviously, uh, starts off with Jesus and a um, couple things that are just worth mentioning um, to kind of just get them out there and make sure that they're part of the knowledge base is that Jesus was a Jew and Jesus um, in different places in scripture was referred to as rabbi or teacher. A lot of times you'll see it in the translations as teacher and the understanding, at least from some historians, was that Jesus in fact was a rabbi. Um, we don't know where the training happened or um, as the historical figure of Jesus, what kind of what went down there. But the assumption therefore is that his understanding of texts, you know, in terms of the human quality of understanding of texts, um, is, a, is a pretty profound one. His ability to read text and ask questions of it and reinterpret it and, you know, to make the law living and kind of engraved on the hearts is a very uh, kind of enfleshed thing that Jesus as a person, you know, or in the, in the physical embodiment, the incarnated Jesus did. His understanding uh, of scripture was profound and deeply um, personally influenced. Now obviously, uh, you know, being uh, the Christ Jesus, there's some reasons for that, uh, but it's also an inspirational thing that I think uh, later on, Fox turns back to you to say, you know, we need to read scripture in this great power. We need to ask these questions. We need to become that familiar with it. So, you know, the, the idea of, of, of Jesus not only being the kind of son of man and the son of God, but also the son of man, son of God that knows his scripture, right? That, that can quote his stuff, that, that gets what's going on with, with these, these people of the house of Israel. Well, that's an important part and an underpinning of the things that come later. Yes. Um, Jesus uh, was crucified. Yes, uh, Son of God. You know, all these things are true and kind of held up and, cru and crucially uh, important to the friends later on. But also this understanding uh, of Jesus as a prophet and a perfected Son of God living uh, perfectly on the earth. That was incredibly important for the friends. Another piece for us to remember about the about Jesus and his importance to friends was n not just his perfection as a son of man but also the ministry that he carried that it was an interpretation of Judaism that was different than what had come before it was not just the letter of the law but it was a message of love and forgiveness and of being with those in the margins the tax collectors the Samaritans the prostitutes and that God cares about the least of these among us and um, that notion of privileging the least of these carries through to what we know about friends today desert mothers and the desert fathers now these aren't folks that the early friends would have known about necessarily but i think in terms of a thematic understanding of christianity they're incredibly important so the desert mothers and the desert fathers were mystical christians that were driven into the desert by the persecution of the roman empire so a lot of times we see uh, you know people in power uh, moving against that which is the radical uh, revolution uh, of social justice because they're challenging the system of power so there were these Christians that were uh, being persecuted against, and so they went out into the desert, and they lived an ascetic life, uh, you know, hair shirts and things like that. Uh, they didn't eat much. There was lots of fasting going on in the desert, and and what these folks did is they, they believed that their under their understanding of Christianity was a mystical one, which is to say they had an unmediated, direct uh, kind of experience of the divine. And we have some of those texts, some of those poems, and some of those writings. And so these desert mothers and fathers lived together in communities in, out in the desert from the kind of the beginning of the 200s of the Common Era 
more or less until the 500s of the Common Era, living together, praying together, forming Christian communities in which individuals had mystical experiences. Now, it's not the same kind of as a meeting for worship, but the idea that there were mystical Christians early on who lived at the margins of community because they were persecuted by the empire and the powers that were at their central of the political structure, in fact, plays itself out again and again and again through the Christian context and during the course of this history we will also see this same kind of mystical Christian living at the margins trying to live a faithful life persecuted by a political system. We'll see that reemerge again. So it's it's worth mentioning that even early on we see this kind of pattern starting to emerge. Another example can be seen in the story of the Christian martyrs. Emblematic of the Christian martyrs is the story of Perpetua and Felicity, who around 203 in the Common Era were put to death by the Roman Empire. Perpetua was a noblewoman, a young mother. Felicity, her, or Felicitas, her uh, slave was pregnant. And they, along with Perpetua's mother and brothers, were all Christian. Her father was still a pagan at that time. And when um, mom and Felicity, Perpetua, Felicitas, and the brothers were all imprisoned. Their father begged them to renounce their Christianity, and they refused, uh, and were put to death. The account of this was written in great detail by Perpetua while they were in prison. And this is an important story because it's about the power of this kind of transformative faith that preaches nonviolence and love and forgiveness and is not coerced by the violence of empire, which is why it was so threatening to empire itself. If violence is not a tool of coercion because one is not afraid to die, then empire doesn't have anything on you. And that's a pretty dangerous place to be. So next we're going to talk, we're going to skip a little bit more ahead in history and talk about Constantine the First. And um, folks may have heard people talk about pre-Constantinian Christianity and post-Constantinian Christianity. Um, up until this point, the Roman Empire had been pretty much at odds at war and persecuting uh, the Christians. And it was Constantine who was the first Roman emperor who actually adopted Christianity as a state religion. There are stories of him going to battle with the cross on Roman shields and um, stories actually of his own conversion experience. The trickiness about this is that once a uh, religion that is critical of the empire becomes a religion of the empire, the ability to criticize that institution into which you are embedded becomes much more difficult. Well, some theologians, including a theologian named Yoder, have talked about something called the Constantinian shift. So that's, if, the, if, if Christianity lives at the margins, if it's about serving the poor and serving the widows and uh, serving the foreigner, the stranger, the other, then when it becomes adopted by a system of coercive power, it becomes much more difficult to challenge that system of power. Because in some ways, at least these are some of the liberal progressive thinking about it, in some ways it is that system of power which put those people on the margins in the first place. Why are there orphans? Why are there widows? Why are these people not being taken care of? Because the state, capital S, isn't taking care of them. So when the state aligns itself with Christianity, and you say you're a Christian, but you're you know, opposed to the policies that make these people poor and hungry and starving and unclothed and unfed, then the state comes back to you and says, that's not true, and because we're the religion, you know, you're wrong and you're a heretic. So some people who are kind of in this line of uh, questioning Const Constantine are also raising the question of, you know, is it possible to have, uh, you know, a state, a fully powerful political uh, kind of army uh, having uh, empire that's also then authentically Christian? And these folks would question that and say, what is, what is the violent Christian empire and what place does it have? And they would ask some very specific and critical questions about that. And we'll see, of course, later, the friends ask the same type 
of questions, you know, what job do you have calling yourself Christian if you're doing X, Y, and Z? And, you know, to the degree that you agree with them or not is, you know, up in the air. But those are the same kinds of questions that folks ask about Constantine, and they're also the same questions that the friends end up asking. Okay, so now we skip ahead quite a while, and we move to Martin Luther. And um, this next big shift that seems relevant has to do with a couple different things. So um, Martin Luther is a monk, and he's a very bright guy, as far as we know. Um, and one of the things that Luther um, had an issue with is something called indulgences. Now, I'm not a Christian historian by trade, and so folks out there may know more about this, but my understanding of indulgences is that there were certain types of prayer and certain um, types of penance that could be received if you paid for it. And so essentially what was happening is that there were folks who were more wealthy who were able to essentially be, be less sinful because the priest could remove more because of the money. Now at some level that makes sense. You know, uh, money is energy and so if you're giving more money, you're giving more of yourself and that's a kind of sacrifice. But it also doesn't quite feel right paying to have your sins removed. So, uh, Luther had some issues with indulgences. He ended up writing these things called the 95 Theses. It was in 1517, and he was really staking a claim against the Catholic Church and saying, you know, I don't think this is right. And one of his claims for this, he said, I don't see where these types of things are anywhere in this scripture. And you tell me that I need to believe it because the Pope says it, and that the Cardinals say it, and the Archbishops, and, and the Pope is infallible, but you know, I'm not so sure about that. I think what's infallible is the Word of God. I think what we need to be turning to is Scripture. And so what he started to do is to translate the Holy Scriptures, both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, the Gospel, into languages that the lay people could read, into the languages that the common people could actually have access to. And this was all part of a big turnover for Luther to say, if it is in fact the Word of God which should guide us, and not the Word of this ordained Pope, this infallible human, then we need to make sure that the Word of God is available to all. And for Luther, what he was talking about in the Word of God was the book, the Bible, the, the, the canonical scriptures. And so he began to translate it into German, which had not been made available. Previously, he had done some English translations by a guy named John Wycliffe. And so between the two of those, there was this huge transformation, and suddenly the common people began to become a literate in general, being able to read, and B, becoming literate with the Holy Scriptures. So now they began to interpret it. A pastor within the Protestant tradition is different than the priest. The priest is the means through which understanding of the divine comes. The, the, the priest is a, a mediated connection to the divine. You to the priest, priest to God. And you can hear God, but through the priest only, through the act of ordination, which brings a person into a state of uh, capacity to kind of hear from God. Now, Luther said, no, 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 it's not just about the ordination, it's about everyone being able to discern it from the scripture. And so the move away from the priesthood into a priesthood of all believers, which was Luther's big push, begins at that beginning of the 1500s. Now, friends will later come in and say, you're, you were right, Luther, uh, it is about everyone being able to access the spirit and God, but it's not just through the book and the words of the scripture, it's actually through the power of the Holy Spirit, which pervades all things at all times, and we need to to quiet down and listen to be able to hear the Spirit. And they didn't do away with Scripture, but their focus was much more on the prevalence and the, 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 the presence of, of God in their midst at all times, not just in the book that was closed off. Um, so, so Luther made a big step towards making uh, the priesthood of all believers possible and making uh, the Word of God more available to all folks, uh, but he put it into the book. He, he said that the, the, the Word of God is incredibly important, and in Protestant traditions, uh, especially in the United States today, that tends to be the case still. The Word of God, i.e. the book, the Bible, the Word of God, has a in, vaunted uh, place in, in their theology and their belief and in their practice. We're zooming closer in this next part, closer and closer into Quakers, and we've moved off of the uh, continent of Europe and onto the British Islands. And our next figure is Charles I. Charles I was the King of England after Elizabeth and um, he made some changes to the form of the, uh, the Anglican Church as well as to the structure of Parliament that caused a lot of moment and a series of wars. We talk about the English war and it was really a series of wars that some people talk about as the, the English Revolution. Um, 
parliament was called only at the pleasure of the king and usually it's so that the king could uh, get them to enact some sort of fundraising tax or something. Um, Charles didn't call parliament for almost 11 years and that was the 11 years tyranny. He also married Catherine of um, Huguenot, a French Catholic, which caused a lot of uproar in England, people being afraid that the, the princes and princesses of Charles and Catherine would be raised as Catholics. Um, pretty scary thought in merry old England where the Catholic Church had been replaced by the Church of England, the Anglican Church, for some time. He started also to make some changes to the Anglican Church to make it um, look more and more like a Catholic Church, a higher sort of Anglican Church with greater ceremony, pomp, and more um, vestments that were of finer sorts of fabrics and uh, replacing wooden altars with stone tables, some things that made it start to look like the Catholic Church. This made people uncomfortable. Uh, and all of these things caused a series of rebellions in England in the 1630s, 40s, 50s. You better say this part because I don't really know and I'm going to stop now. So uh, what happens during Charles's reign is that there's, there's all these different kind of denominations that are starting to pop up. In this period of crisis, uh, political um, insanity, uh, the, the tyranny, all these things that are happening in the middle of the 1600s, there's all these different denominations that are popping up, both on the mainland, kind of in France and Germany, as well as on the, uh, in the British Isles. And it is during this period and time that uh, the, the Friends first kind of uh, start to emerge. Now, uh, in the in-between time between Charles I and Charles II, there's this thing called the Interregnum, which is when Oliver Cromwell, uh, who's called the, the kind of Lord Protectorate of England, kind of steps forward. And uh, it's, it's in this period that some of the kind of most intense Quaker things are first starting. The Society of Friends is really starting to, to build. Uh, it's in the late 1640s that George Fox who we'll get to in a little bit, uh, kind of has some of his openings and is beginning to preach in the countryside in northern England. And it's um, towards the beginning of the 50s when uh, we start to switch um, and move out and send folks out into the world from the religious society. And what happens is when uh, King Charles II comes in and replaces the interregnum period where we've got um, Lord Cromwell in there, um, some, some sweeping changes start to hit. Some taxes come back. Uh, and people start to be persecuted and try to be pulled into the army. It's during the reign of Queen Charles II um, that uh, George Fox actually articulates in a letter to Charles um, what folks now often point to as the peace testimony. And um, that peace testimony is addressed in, a, in another video. But the, the important thing is that in Charles II and his uh, changes in the English government and the recruiting of people to go to war and the creation of these armies and these states, these taxation and things like that, it's, it's because of this and all of the other civil unrest that's happening uh, that the friends find lots of things to work against or work towards re redeeming. Uh, they saw a lot that was going on that they didn't think was very Christian and as a result there was lots of work for them to do. So we have come up at the end to uh, George Fox and the Fells. That's Margaret Fell and her husband, the Judge Fell. Um, so uh, Fox was raised, he was of a lower class, and um, early on there's journal, uh, journal entries from folks who knew him or knew people who knew him when he was a young child. He was apparently always somewhat withdrawn and a kind of serious person. And he realized early on in, in his life, um, you know, that, there, that he was of this kind of uh, inward nature. And uh, he grew older and had a series of openings, what he called uh, revelations, some, some pretty serious um, understandings. And while he was in his young 20s, as I understand it, he kind of set off alone and in search of some people for whom the religious life was authentic in a way that spoke to, to Fox, to George Fox. And he said, you know, the, the priests 
and the professors of religion, it seems like they're just using the words, but they're not really living in a way that's, you know, kind of in integrity or, or the, the way that truly speaks of their transformed life. And he, he set out to kind of find these people. So there's a period in time which he's alone and kind of wandering and receiving, um, as the, his journals say, these realizations, these revelations, what he calls openings. And uh, it's during this time that he really starts preaching and kind of spreading his understanding of the way that the, the spirit is at work in the world. Well, he eventually comes across the Fells, who are of an upper class, um, aristocratic uh, kind of status level. And at that point in time in England, uh, if you were of a lower class, which Fox would have been, you, you had no right and no means to petition the courts. You kind of didn't have any legal representation. You had to have a lord or, or someone of the gentry be able to speak uh, for you. And so the Fells were of that level. And Judge Fell, in fact, often intervened on Fox's behalf and on the uh, behalf of the early friends. And Margaret Fell, uh, who was Judge Fell's wife, opened up their home, Swarthmore Hall, um, to worship of friends and to some planning and thinking of this new religious development that was eventually called the, the Religious Society. And Fell um, was a huge organizer and, and put a lot of her family's money and time and energy into kind of organizing and sending out and checking in with the ministers who were moving and spreading out all over the, the UK and into kind of the continental parts of Europe and eventually uh, over into the New World in North America. So um, after her husband died, uh, Judge Fell, what ended up happening is that George Fox and Margaret Fell were married. Some folks call her Margaret Fell Fox, sometimes Margaret Fox or Margaret Fell, um, but this woman was an enormous supporter of the early uh, friends. Sometimes she called the mother of Quakerism along with George Fox. And it was her organizational capacity, her administrative gifts, and her uh, broad vision for what it was uh, that really helped the movement get started. She was converted early on from some of Fox's preaching and she realized that in fact the life that Fox was trying to live was much more from her sense at that time in, in line with the gospel and she said you know what a silly poor gospel we've been living and saying we've been doing in fact there's a whole new life available to us if we listen to the presence of Christ in our midst now and so her conversion experience was also touched along with that of uh, her husband Judge Fell and so the whole the whole thing kind of started to mix together and as a result uh, the movement began to slowly spread so the the piece that closes this off is to say that the religious society uh, in its earliest stages was still experimenting with its forms and its understandings, its belief, and its theology. And so in the next video, what we'll examine is the origins of the unprogrammed meeting for worship. We'll take a look at some of um, the pieces of that jewel of Quakerism, uh, that thing, what the, what the early friends understood, um, some of uh, our understanding of what meeting for worship is, and we'll try and address that in a fairly mm, timely and short, concise piece of video as well. And this is uh, for a class that we are doing at Pendle Hill 2009. If folks are in the area, they are certainly welcome to drop in on the class at Pendle Hill. My wife Christina and I are here for six weeks teaching this course. and We wanted to also uh, get information out to the world and onto YouTube. So uh, thanks for watching and we'll be in touch.